Hey everyone, welcome to session 159 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. In today's episode, Michael Maloney returns to the show and we spend uh, a fir- the first couple of minutes catching up since the last time we spoke way back in session 129. But then we pivot to the main, I guess, crux or topic of this episode, and that's his recent collaboration with the Canadian charity organization, the Amarok Society. Now, together with the Amarok Society and with help from the Rotary International uh, Literacy Initiative, these partners deployed Michael's reading program, The Maloney Method, to over 2,500 children in some of the poorest areas of Bangladesh using neighborhood moms as instructors and delivering the instruction through smartphone-based technologies. It's really just an amazing story. I'm going to keep this introduction pretty brief here so we can get right to it because I'm not going to do it justice here in my opening comments. Uh, I just, again, would implore you to check out the entire conversation because it's, again, just a fascinating story of the potential for good that behavior analysis can do, especially when we reach out and work with other partners. So uh, for those interested in learning more about Michael or his reading program uh, or the software itself, you can go to the MalonyMethod.com. Um, and if you want to learn more from Michael directly, he's doing a series of webinars with uh, our other friends, Behavior Development Solutions, uh, all throughout the month of June. So uh, you can go to BehaviorDevelopmentSolutions.com and just put in Michael Maloney in the search bar. I'll have a link to it in the show notes along with all the other things that we discussed in this podcast episode. Before we get to the conversation itself, I do want to say a quick thanks to our sponsors. Uh, We are sponsored by HRI Recruiting. Uh, When you are working with HRI recruiters, you're working directly with the owner. There's no middleman involved. So you're working directly with Barb Voss, who's been recruiting BCBAs for over a decade. And she's been in the recruiting business for over 30 years more generally. She really knows her stuff. So um, check out HRI Recruiting if you are looking for a job or if you're looking to hire. We're also brought to you by the Whoopstrap. Uh, you've heard me talk about the whoop strap before. I love wearing it when I forget to put it back on. I feel like, uh, I feel like I've left my kid at the mall or something like that. Um, (laughs) I just really love getting all the data that comes along with it on things like sleep, uh, calorie burn, uh, as well as their proprietary, um, metrics such as recovery and strain. It's really just a great piece of technology. If you want to learn more about it, uh, go to, uh, well, you can check out uh, the show I did with John Catadalupo, the co-founder, uh, but you can also go to behavioralobservations.com and click on Get the Whoop Strap uh, to learn more. So I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's get right to this fascinating conversation with Michael Maloney. <laughs> Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Michael Maloney, welcome back to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. How are you doing today, sir? I'm just great, Matt. It's good to see you again. Well, uh, so there's been a lot happening since, uh, you know, it wasn't too long ago, as a matter of fact, uh, when, when we talked, but uh, I think there's been a lot happening on your end. You had some, you reached out to me with some exciting news about some of the work you've been doing, uh, particularly with uh, teaching um, kids to read in Bangladesh. Uh, and so I really want to get into that story. Uh, before we do that, though, um, I want to just catch up more generally and just uh, obviously just kind of checking in with with other stuff that you've been up to. Um, but as uh, as you likely recall, we spent the uh, majority of time the last time talking about uh, reading instruction and things like right. that. Uh, the uh, the pandemic has continued apace, uh, so that didn't go away in the time in which we last chatted, uh, although things look like they're getting a little bit better with the uh, distribution of vaccines, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I guess where I'd like to start, Michael, before we get into your dissemination work is, uh, what is your assessment of the, I guess, state of reading instruction, uh, perhaps in relation to some of these 
kind of massive educational disruptions that we've seen over the last year or so. Uh, yeah. So uh, what are you seeing yeah. from your perspective, I guess, is what I'm saying. Well, Matt, from, from my perspective, I'm seeing what is really a, a paradigm shift. Uh, basically, what it is is a situation where we have a way to teach children reading that's known to be very successful. We have a huge number of students, 10 million of them, who are enrolled in our public schools who cannot read. We have 3 million teachers, most of whom have never touched base with direct instruction, precision teaching, even behavior analysis. And so the situation has changed in that if we really want to get on top of this problem, we're not going to be able to continue doing what we have done for the last 40 years, which I turn tender to refer to as drive-by consulting where somebody comes in, spends a day with a staff, training them on something, goes away. There's never any follow-up, never any supervision, never any data comes out of it. And two weeks later, everybody's long since forgotten what it was. So my position, and it's been that way now for close to 10 years, is that we absolutely have to make a shift in the way in which we put technology into the hands of our teachers. And fortunately, if there's one good thing that is coming out of COVID, it, it has forced the blended classroom upon us. Now, badly to start with, because our teachers weren't prepared, our systems weren't prepared. You know, there was it was really a, a, a battle. And we have to laud our teachers for doing what they did and tried to do as best they could in a very, very bad situation. So coming out the other side of that now, I think what we're going to see is the development of programs that will be put in the hands of the teachers that they don't have to go home and create night after night at the kitchen table, and they will be able to deliver a product uh, virtually or however, um, that will be well-tested, well-designed, well-implemented, and take the burden off of them so they can deliver good curriculum and help kids either in small groups, individually, or even as large classes. So I think we're, we're on, the, we're on a, a breaking point here. I see. Uh, have you seen any of these systems implemented in the last, uh, you know, several months? You know, uh, it sounds exciting that, you know, we, we and well, I know they're I, not they're, they're probably not created yet. I see. Right? There, there's one out there that we know it will make a, a good example of what should be and could be coming. And that's uh, the uh, reading program that was developed by a group of, of behaviorists. Um, and it's, uh, the name escapes me right now. Uh, <laughs> don't worry about it. it. You know, we'll, yeah. uh, we'll drop it, Joe we'll Lang drop it in his, the show notes. Uh, yeah. Joe Lang and Janet Twyman and people like that had a hand in it. Uh, oh, is that the head sprout? Head sprout. Yes. Yeah, head yes. Sprout. Now, that's been around now for, for quite a long time, and it's having some good success. It collects data. I mean, it is a good prototype from which we can build other types of curriculum like that. Got it. Got it. Yep. And, and the, I will, the interesting I will... thing. Go ahead. Interesting thing about this, uh, Matt, is that we've got 3 million teachers in the U.S., right? Probably about 100 uh, 90 to 100,000 of them are in kindergarten, grade one, grade two, or special ed. How do you train 100 to 150,000 teachers uh, across a nation as large as North America, or two nations? Right? Yeah. So it, it just begs for us to go viral by going virtual. Yeah, definitely. You need something that scales uh, and the. Uh the in-person workshop um, is tough to scale for sure. It's impossible to scale and it's impossible to follow up, right? You can, and in many cases, you don't get an opportunity to supervise the people that you've trained and to make sure that they are getting assistance when and when they need it. So that model just hasn't worked. Uh, we've, even Ogden Lindsay said 85% of the people we train in precision teaching quit charting within a year. 
that's kind of that's a hard rap on his own work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder. I wonder what. You know, you'd think that, uh, you know, I mean, that's an interesting, that's an interesting statistic given how fervent um, the precision teaching people are about using the chart yeah. and whatnot. And yeah. they seem, there seems to be a lot of reinforcement derived from, you know, seeing accelerations well, I, I, I and things like that. You know, yeah. you, th you think that would, you think it would be higher than that when people kind of, uh, you know, kind of uh, took the red pill or saw the light, if you will, as it relates to seeing data and, and seeing, you know, the, uh, uh, seeing a uh, pinpoint and learning targets kind of accelerate in that way. Yeah. Well, I think basically there is, there are a couple of explanations for it. Uh, one of them is that every time you put a dot on a chart, you're subjecting yourself to accountability. So uh, there are very few other programs out there that will give you that level of accountability for each and every student you're teaching. And that can be pretty scary. I mean, if you work all day in a classroom and you've got, as I did in my in the learning center when we first integrated these methodologies back in like 1975, I had 20 kids, each of whom would have 10 to 15 charts. And at the end of the day, at least 10 to 15 percent of those charts would require a change because they'd either met the fluency standard or they were flatlining. Well, now that I've done a hard day of teaching, now I get to sit down and, and adjust 10 to 15 to 30 programs. Right. And I've got to have a strategy to adjust to. So uh, I think that teachers who get too involved too quickly set, set themselves up to be overwhelmed by the amount of data and work that comes from the use of the chart. Now, I was fortunate. I had great staff. Not every teacher has two or three pairs of hands around to help you. I also had great you know, mentors because Eric Houghton and Elizabeth were working with me as I set up that school. So I, I'm not a good case study for that. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think where we're kind of heading towards is that this is a situation that uh, kind of begs for a technological solution, as uh, we've talked about, certainly uh, the last time you were on. So mm -hmm. uh, so let, let's... Um, Let's talk about that a little bit. And certainly I want to get into, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the work that you've been doing uh, in, uh, in Bangladesh. So uh, you, you reached out to me telling me about the, this uh, endeavor that you've, uh, you've teamed up with a couple of different organizations to teach kids, uh, underprivileged kids in Bangladesh, how to read. Uh, I, I'm, I'm curious uh, just how this all began, because it sounds like a, a combination of various factors and various organizations coming together and things like that. So it sounds like quite the story. So I'd, I'd love to hear just, you know, what was well, the start of this and yeah. so on. So it really was a situation, uh, Matt, of being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I returned from doing some work with uh, Eva Haito uh, setting up a school for, for children with autism in Hong Kong. And I got home and I had a message from my librarian asking me to call her. And when I did, she said, we had a, a speaker here last night uh, and he has written a book and I think you'd be interested, but I've got to put it on the reserve shelf. So if you could come and pick it up for a day, you can have it. Otherwise, it's going on the shelf. Well, I went and picked it up and I sat down and by midnight, I'd finished it. And, and it was about uh, a family, a Canadian family, working for a small uh, NGO called uh, Amarok Society. And she is a PhD educator and had been asked to do an, an evaluation of the Bangladeshi, of the Dhaka Bangladesh uh, school system. And as expected, she found it was horrible. I'm sorry, who is this, uh, who is this individual? Yeah. Her name is Dr. Um, oh, she's got a very interesting name. Her last, um, it'll come back to me as we work. Sure. Uh, Tannis Monroe, T-A-N-Y-S-S, -S, and her husband, Jim, G-E-M, both interesting characters. But what they found was there was also, there were millions of kids in this city that could not go to school at all because they couldn't afford the tuition, even for this very bad 
public system. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to move into the slums and start schools in the slums for these kids. And they did. And uh, I happened to, when I read their book, notice that there was a, a telephone number on the back spine. So I called it and it turned out to be in Vancouver, but they were in Ottawa. So I offered to meet them for lunch because they were on their way to on a book signing tour across America with their kids, everything they owned uh, in their camper van, which was actually a, just a, an RV or not an RV, but an SUV. Mm -hmm. And uh, we met and again, serendipitously, the International Rotary Conference was being held in Montreal two weeks hence. So I suggested that one book and running around to bookstores and libraries was not going to cut it for them. I mean, I, I was an author by the time I had already done several years of, of book tours, and I knew that they'd never survive on one book. So I said, why don't you start working with, let me help you get hooked up with Rotary Clubs. They pay for speakers and they have a mandate to help with literacy. And they're always interested in things that are uh, in, from impoverished situations. So they're, they're the kind of first line helpers for many, many different kinds of projects. And they started speaking at Rotary Clubs and they were able to raise enough money and to get enough support, uh, Rotary Club's throwing in two or $3,000, that they expanded their operation to about, uh, well, right now, 20-some schools. And they've got about 2,500 kids involved. And these kids are being taught by the mothers. And the mothers are working all day, and then they come home in the late afternoon or early evening. And each mother is trained, first of all, in Bangla then in English, and then they start teaching everything they've learned to five to 10 children. And uh, we, uh, my, I happened to be a Rotarian at the time. I was the, the literacy chair for our Rotary Club, and that's how I got involved. So essentially, uh, we've uh, been able to get them a grant uh, an international rotary grant for $100,000 to help support them. And they have become fast friends with Rotary. And Amarok Society is a small uh, organization run by only two or three people. And they have been able to keep pace with all of this development. So it's, it's a great story in that for children who would never have an opportunity to become literate, these women, these mothers are, are taking it to the streets and, and pulling these kids in and teaching them how to read. And, and once they get that done, they'll probably start with other subjects, right? Are you looking for a new job, but you're overwhelmed with all the emails that you're getting from various ABA agencies? What if there was someone who was in your corner and could help you find the perfect job placement? Well, that person exists. Barbara Voss has been working as a recruiter for over 30 years, and her company, HRIC, specializes in placing BCBAs in permanent full-time positions throughout the United States. Barbara has been placing BCBAs since 2011, so she knows our business, and she offers personalized service to any BCBA looking for a new position. She also helps companies looking to hire BCBAs, too. Here are just some of the things Barbara can help you with. She can provide information about salary ranges in different markets across the country. She can help you write your resume. She can coordinate and prepare you for the interview process and even help negotiate the right salary for you. And best of all, there are no charges to any candidate for all of these services. When you are ready to make a change and want to work with someone who will listen to you and understand what you need in a new position, contact Barbara at HRIC. To schedule a confidential discussion, head over to hricolorado.com. Again, that's hricolorado.com and hit the contact button to connect with Barbara. You won't be disappointed. So how did you get hooked up with them and how are they using the, you know, the, the Maloney method, the software or things well, like that? I want, to hear, because yeah. I want to hear the tech angle of this as well, but uh, <laughs> okay. I love, I love hearing how things develop as so, so. Yeah. It's as again, as I say, it was quite serendipitous. I, I suggested that uh, 
that uh, I take uh, Tanis with us to the Montreal International Rotary Conference. And because I was a literacy chair, I was working the conference at in the literacy booth. So we rounded up. And, and at that conference, all of the leadership for, in literacy from top to bottom was there. So I had cornered all the people who were the, the decision makers. Uh, and I just said, hey, can't we help these people? And Tanis made a pitch to them. And they said, hey, let's go get the Bangladeshis into this. So we rounded up all the Bangladeshi uh, delegates who were there, got them in a table, uh, got them around a table and hammered out a, a memorandum of understanding as to how Rotary would support Amarok Society from both sides, from Bangladesh and from Canada. Uh, so that's how that all happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we just started putting the, the money in their hands and the and the the uh, training and whatever else they needed. I see. So just to make sure I understand it uh, correctly. So these are, these are um, mothers teaching kids in their own homes. Well, they're not homes. I mean, okay. You're talking slums here. We're talking about, you know, shanties. I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. This looks like the deep South on its worst day. Understood. Understood. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's where the instruction is taking place though. Yeah, it okay. is. Right. Now, the other interesting thing about this is these women are now reading the newspapers to the other women who are not yet learned in are not yet literate. And so the community is changing because the information, the communication has improved and is widening. And people who didn't, who had to take someone else's word for it, a soundbite, are now being read to or at least getting lots of good information. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so you were uh, kind of to share with me some of the software solutions that you've developed. And uh, uh, okay. w one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, and I know you talked about a little bit about this last time, but it was, uh, so it required, it requires an English speaking person to yes. operate it with, with the learner. Yes. Um, so was there a, uh, um, did you have to scale up the English speaking and English reading population in these in these communities before well, yeah, a, being able no. to implement your, your no, software? No, right now there are there are three to five hundred Bangladeshi women in Dhaka who have either learned English or are in the process of learning their English. So mm -hmm. uh, the problem we have, Matt, is very simply that we don't have enough technology support. Uh, they need cell phones. The, the good news about Bangladesh is that it has high speed, stable, cheap internet. So, and it reaches right into these slums. So these women have cell phones. So they uh, can use their cell phones to down to stream the program and teach it to one or more children. But they don't have that many cell phones. So, you know, we're not we're trying to uh, get into a situation where we will be able to supply three to five hundred mothers with a seventy five dollar a year Internet plan and a new cell phone. And uh, I'm in the midst of a competition. My company is in the midst of a competition with World Vision and UNICEF who are offering uh, exactly that. And their target is Bangladesh. So uh, I'm hopeful that we will be successful there and we'll be able to help Amarok even more. I see. I see. This is a, uh, this is all really exciting. I, uh, you know, it's um, uh, what, what, uh, so the, the, the target, I guess repertoire obviously is 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 reading in English. Um, is mm -hmm. was that because that's kind of what your where the, the knowledge base well, was, or yeah. in terms no. of this, or talk a little bit about that versus you know some <laughs> na native languages and whatnot. And yeah, basically it was me having done a fair amount of training of teachers and psychologists and aides and and that, and recognizing that as Ogden pointed out, that a large proportion of it faded away rather quickly after we, after we finished the training. 
and and I thought yeah, there's got to be a better way. And, and it turns out the better way is not to have to rely on the learner to monitor and and uh, you know disseminate the information, but to bury it deep inside a device so that it's available to the to the teacher and the learner, but isn't dependent upon them. And then uh, that's that's the only way I see us being able to have a something that is scalable and reliable and is able to uh, to deliver good programming uh, at any time, anywhere. And I would say, are you familiar with the Khan Academy? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, I should uh, also say my kids are very familiar with the kind of <laughs> Okay. Well, there you go. There, there's probably the best example of anyone. Solomon Khan has built an amazing uh, system, and uh, he started out in a closet. Now he's got Bill Gates and others, you know, supporting him, and uh, that's the kind of help that your kids might need at some point and they can go get it at their leisure as many times as they need it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I just kind of thought, okay, we need to do that with the fundamentals behind all of this. Solomon Khan does a great job on things like science and other subjects. His is primarily aimed at the high school level. We need to be the feeder school to the school to the Khan Academy. We need to take the kids who are, are having difficulty and get them up to speed so they can benefit from that. Do you know, uh, Michael, if there's been any outreach to Khan Academy from the precision teaching DI community? <laughs> Not that I know of. No, yeah. uh, we're, you know, we are in silos a little bit now. Yeah. A few years, like 45 years ago, Eric Houghton and Elizabeth and I integrated the three methods uh, and started putting them into schools. Uh, but we even got Zig Engelman and Og Lindsley on the same stage for a session called Engelman and Lindsley in the Classroom, the Best of Both Worlds, and thought that they would cross-fertilize and intermarry, and we would get DI people doing PT and PT people doing DI. Well, half of it worked. Most of the DI people uh, took on direct instruction, but very, very few of the, P of the, of the DI people were interested in, in precision teaching. So even that didn't work. I see. <laughs> oh, man. Um Oh, so let's get back to this. Uh, let's get back to Bangladesh here for a second. Yeah. Uh, so, what what outcomes are you seeing uh, from from these? I, I'm assuming that your platform collects data and yes, and tracks does. and whatnot. So, uh, I'd love to hear what okay. what what are the outcome measures that you, you folks are seeing from from the the implementation of this right. uh, really cool project. Well, first of all, the the system, uh, the digital reading system is designed as a direct instruction program. So we're taking the benefits of direct instruction that Zig Engelman provided us and building it into a digital program. It also uses the standard acceleration, a simplified version of the standard acceleration chart to measure three or four different pinpoints. And it does that automatically that all a person has to do is put in the numbers and it comes up on the chart and it's ready to go. So we have two and it has verbal reinforcers uh, throughout the tasks. So we have all three major methodologies represented. Uh, you may have to, you know, add a point system or an activity to it if, if the child is a little more rambunctious, but the capacity is there for that. So, uh, Basically, the issue was to get that into the hands of Amarok Society. And once we found out that they had good, stable, cheap internet, then we decided, can we make this thing work? Well, they have almost no computers. So then it was a question of Nesda, my technical partner, uh, to find a way to get it to work on cell phones. Yep. And so Nesta I, is the uh, is a tech tech company from Canada, and and that's uh, in your community, right? Uh, they're more than a tech company from 
from Canada. Is that, under, is that a colossal understatement? <laughs> it's colossal indeed, Matt. This is our 10th project together. Okay. I hired the now owner of Nesda when he was 17 years old to build our very first piece of software, which was called MathTutor. Mm. And Michael Summers uh, built that and then went on. We were at we were approached by Scholastic to make their uh, top line math series called Math Tutor, which took us five years. And Michael delivered every one of their eight packages on time and on budget. Right. So Michael and I have worked together now for 40 years. So I, you know, I think of him more as a brother than as a working partner. Sure. And he, they do amazing work. So they came out, they got that done. And then we started trying to get it over to Bangladesh. Well, first of all, uh, we found out that the computers are, are not going to work. So we have to go to cell phones. Well, very few of the women have cell phones. They have some do. And uh, so it's being a very slow development. Uh, if you know anything about Southeast Asia, well, the one thing you're going to find out very quickly is things do not move very quickly. Mm. And so we probably now have maybe a half dozen women who are coaching two to three or four kids. So, I mean, I mean the program itself is less than a year old. Right, right. So <laughs> to get it to this point and roll it out and get it started in Bangladesh, has been a, a huge challenge. Uh, and thank God for the people I'm working with because they, they literally have taken this thing over and, and made it go. Mm -hmm. uh, so give us six more months and I'll be able to give you some pretty hard data uh, on the kids. I do have some videos of one teacher teaching five kids. Uh, so, I know it's working and I know it's working well. And Tannis Monroe keeps telling us these kids are learning really quickly and they're learning how to say the words that were difficult for them when they were just learning them from a book. Right. So, so yeah, uh, I need, I need time for proof of concept. Understood. Understood. In that sense. Uh, well, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of taking us. I feel like I'm on a, a along the ride with you here so well, you are is, you're is, you're part of the publication of this, this if, is, uh, if we don't get cool. the word out on this matt it's not going anywhere yeah yeah so uh, let's talk about that one of the things i think that's neat that you uh, or at least neat from my perspective mainly because i don't know uh, much about it i'm just curious is that uh, you used a uh, crowdfunding strategy to help uh, in addition to the funds that you, you were able to recruit from rotary etc um so that's a whole area I, i'm totally clueless about can you oh, talk about fun. that and yeah uh, how, sure. how does it work and all that stuff well first of all let's be clear that all the money that came from rotary went directly to amrock society mm -hmm. we we certainly never got a penny of that nor did we ever expect to sure. uh, we we were just in in the scene of trying to assist uh, Amarok Society to get themselves, you know, installed. And I mean, if these two people, Tannis and Jem Monroe, are willing to go and live in those slums, when they were told, if you go, you're first of all, you're never going to get in. And if you get in, you're never going to get out. And you want to talk to the women. Well, they have no rights and no standing, and their husbands will beat them if they start looking smarter than their husbands. So give it up. And Tannis turned to the person who was from the Red Cross and said, so you know that how? From your experience with these people? I said, no, we never go in there. Well, I guess we're going to have to. And mm -hmm. off she and her husband and her family, three kids, and moved into these slums. Now, that, that's gutsy. That's much more courage than I'll ever have. That's, uh, that's skin in the game for sure. Oh, boy, absolutely. So uh, we just decided to do everything we could to help them. And uh, the Rotary clubs love that kind of thing. Uh, Rotary is the largest service organization in the world. 1.2 million members around the world in like 200 countries. So we're, we're a pretty big force. We're stamping out polio in all but about 300 cases a year now. And it's mm. taken 15 years and about $4 billion and several lives. But they're getting it done. So... Amazing. I'm happy to be working with them. But in any case, yeah, we, we that's where it all started. 
So what was the crowdfunding p- piece of this? Uh, well, was- we didn't have any money. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Talk about the process, though, I guess. It's like, okay. what, what, what platform did you use? How did you promote uh, yeah. it? You know, I'm just okay. curious about the nuts and bolts of it. Once again, I, I, I called together my kitchen cabinet. These are friends and, and, and colleagues who are in the game and, and are open minded and will tell me exactly what they think I need to know. They're, they're not shy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, they suggested that if we were going to do this, we were going to need money. And I couldn't agree more because I didn't have any. So we decided on a uh, strategy of uh, fundraising, crowdfunding. And you get two choice. Two, there are maybe 20 different crowdfunding platforms out there. Uh, two of the major ones are uh, the Indiegogo and and uh, Jumpstart or something start. And I chose Indiegogo because they have a flexible platform in which the money you rate you raise is the money you get minus their administration fees and 6% or something, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the other one, uh, quick start. No, it's not quick start. It's any case. It's, uh, I, know, I know the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's the big one. It's yes. the granddaddy of them all. Kickstarter. Uh, Kickstarter. Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Kickstarter only runs a platform that you get what you earn only if you reach your target. Well, you know, if you fall short, you don't get anything. All the all the donations get credited back to the credit cards of the people who donate it. Mm-hmm. So then you go th- you have to go through this process where you set up the program, you decide what are these people going to get if they donate to your cause, and what can you do to get a large enough number of people involved in your in your setting that in your program that will raise the money you need. Hey everyone, just want to take a quick break before the conclusion of the episode and ask you to consider checking out the Behavioral Observations Patreon group. Yep, that's right. There are several tiers that are available and lots of cool benefits. Uh, Some of the benefits include ad-free podcast feeds. That's right. You don't have to hear commercial interruptions like these. Uh, Some of the tiers involve bonus content. Uh, You know, so for example, we just um, in a recent episode, actually the last couple of episodes, namely with uh, Drs. Jim Murphy and uh, Ditu Rajaraman, um, there were uh, lengthy bonus segments to those podcasts that are subscriber only. So there's some additional fun things like that. And then we're also planning a Zoom hangout. We're going to do these a couple of times a year, maybe, I don't know, six, six or so times a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. But uh, actually, uh, again, the aforementioned Ditu Rajaraman is going to do a Patreon member hangout with us where members can ask him questions directly so lots of cool stuff happening with the patreon group so if you want to learn more go to behavioralobservations.com forward slash patreon and check it out there all right let's get right back to this conversation with michael we sit we figured we needed a hundred thousand dollars and so we went after the first thing you do is you go after the love money okay the love money is anybody you know who has money who knows you Grandma, right, right, right. Uncle Frank, who's got a billion in the bank, right, but holds <laughs> on to it very tightly. <laughs> That's why he has it and you don't. <laughs> and so uh, I laid out a program and I started uh, with emails and phone calls and face to face visits. And I spent two months raising uh, the first $60,000. And then a very generous educator stepped up to the plate and said, Michael, I'll give you $25,000 if you can hit 100. Wow. That means I got to raise. Yeah, that was very impressive. Well, he was a special ed director. He knew what we were trying to do. He knew the cost of this to kids in his community, and he had money. And he decided he was going to put it where his mouth was, right? So he mm-hmm. said, here's 25 grand if you can raise the remaining 15. Well, that certainly gave me arrows in my quiver. Uh, and my team went out and raised the other uh, amount. And we came out with $103,000. Uh, 
So for anyone who's thinking of crowdfunding, you got to learn how to beg. If you don't know how to beg and are not willing to beg, you're you're not going to be successful. So you, you got to. I was know. just going to ask you that. I was going to ask you know what advice because I know you know there's uh, a lot of behavior analysts out there who want to do things involved in ph- philanthropy and whatnot. So, uh, so learning how to beg is one one piece of advice for absolutely for getting critical. Into this. Yeah. Absolutely critical. Uh, if you're if you do, cannot see past yourself to the kids that are going to benefit from whatever you're doing or the clients or whatever it is that you're, you're working to help, then you're done. You may as well just go for a walk. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I I've often said that many people are afraid to live. You know, they're afraid to put themselves in a position where they could fail. Well, you need to practice failing, right? (laughs) Because you're only going to get good at it or free of it. If you're not afraid of it. And so we, we just have no fear. We just said, we're, we're going to do this. And sure enough, my team, uh, they put it together and they're maintaining it now. Uh, on Friday, I'm going to write the final update for that campaign. It's been two years and we've uh, raised the money, spent the money, delivered the products, delivered the perks. Uh, and have completely successfully concluded that that mission. So, um, but it, it it all starts with having an objective that's worth fighting for. And and most behaviors are sitting in situations where there's a need out there that's way bigger than them that they would really like to do something about, and and they can. But you you got to plan the work. Yeah. And you got to work the plan and you got to be willing to take your tin cup and go and ask somebody, you know, target the people in your community who have money. The first person I targeted was the major builder in this community. And I know him. So it wasn't, I wasn't a stranger to him, but I took him to lunch and got $10,000 from him because wow. he believes in his community. I mean, the same guy gives $150,000 to his local hospital. Because he has it, right? Sure, sure. These people are willing to help if you are willing to go ask. Got it, got it. Um, wh- where are you folks with this in terms, are you still, uh, so while, while we're on the topic of asking, are you, uh, you know, if there are people in the audience who are, you know, excited about this endeavor and, and want to help and whatnot. Are you still collecting donations or what, what no, is the, what is no, the end the, goal here or where? Yeah. Can that campaign people? is over. Okay. Yeah. It, it's over, Matt. Uh, will we do another one? I don't know. Uh, we'll have to wait to see if world vision decides to come in and help us. Uh, I have been scouted by some venture capitalists recently. I'm not very fond of those people, but I have used one before. Uh, we need to keep building. I've got to build level two on my team. We have to build level two in order to have the thousand most common words. And uh, we don't have the money to do it. Mm. Uh, So (laughs) maybe there'll be another fundraising campaign. Right. Who knows? I, I want you to let me know if there is, because uh, I, I I will certainly be happy to donate, it, and I'm happy to spread the word for sure. Oh, that would that would be. See, that's what when you said, you know, what's my role in this? Well, that's <laughs> that's exactly your role is keep the people informed, let them know what's going on, so that they can choose to uh, join us or whatever. Uh, Michael. Uh, where can people go to learn more about this? Uh, it, where where should we direct people to? This is a in terms story. of the fund, the crowdfunding, or in terms of no, the just in project. terms of the, the project or anything else you're involved in. Well, uh, it, we would it be yeah. MaloneyMethod.com. Yeah, MaloneyMethod.com, and uh, they can get an awful lot of material from our website. When COVID first hit and the schools closed. If you recall, there were a lot of parents who were freaking out because all of a sudden they were the teacher. For sure. And they were at home and they didn't know what to do and they were scared and they were frustrated. Well, we took every bit of material we have, all 30 books we've written and all kinds of stuff, and we threw it up on the web instead on our website and said, download as much as you can use and there's no charge. Well, 
we had like a hundred thousand downloads <laughs> over the next little while, and our uh, book sales dropped by ninety percent. <laughs> But that was our contribution to the fight against COVID, right? Mm-hmm. We could we could give parents things that they could, their scripted lessons, they could read through them, they could do them the way they were supposed to, and it would bring them a little peace and a little bit of security that their child is learning something. Well, that, a lot of that is still up there. I see. We had okay. to take it and, and break it into five lesson blocks and charge a buck a lesson. So for $4.95, a lot of it's still free. But the worst thing case is the stuff you have to buy is like four ninety five for five lessons. So they can get all kinds of information. The training is on there as well. If they want to learn more about direct instruction or precision teaching, there there's a f- complete training program on my homepage. If they go to educational resources and hit the one called uh, tests, teaching and tips. It will give them a complete manual, 65-page manual on how to teach direct instruction reading and an MP3 file in which I walk them through all of the sounds that we use in direct instruction and all of the 14 different formats that that make up the program. So anybody could learn this if they really wanted to, and they can learn it for free. Awesome. That's so uh, that's so awesome of you guys to put that out there for uh, nothing or next to nothing. Uh, <laughs> well, so we also followed it up with three videos on precision teaching, how how to use the chart. So and it's a direct instruction approximation of this is how you use the standard acceleration chart. So, again, it's going to take you through a step at a time. Okay, I'm taking copious notes here. I'll make sure that these are in the show <laughs> okay. notes for anyone listening. <laughs> Wonderful. Over at MalonyMethod.com. And um, it's called the PT Videos. PT Videos. It's under the products page. Very cool. Very cool. Michael, this has been a fascinating story. Thanks so much for reaching out to me to share it. And thanks for coming back and spending. Well, Matt, I wanted you to have the, I wanted you to have the story first because I really liked the way we worked together the last time I thought I'm going to give Matt a call, see if he's got time to do this. And I'm, I'm sure glad you did. Yep. Yep. Uh, Happy, happy to do it. All right, Michael, thank you very much. Okay. We shall be, Oh, by the way, can I mention one last thing? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, we are working with uh, Behavior Development uh, Solutions, and I've put together, I've been hearing back from a lot of uh, BCBAs and RBTs, uh, and they are looking for webinars in speech, language, fine motor, and gross motor uh, topics. And so I put together with BDS, Maloney Method and BDS, have four seminars coming up in June, the 16th, 18th, 23rd, and 25th. And you may or may not know these names. Jonathan, Amy, and uh, Rochelle uh, Yeich are doing one on motor behavior. I've got the only speech therapist I've ever met, uh, Michelle Bossy, who uses the chart with her kids. Uh, as a speech therapist, got Adriana uh, Horn, who has is teaching her child language skills, and she is a homeschooling mom with a child on the spectrum. And then I've got Elizabeth Houghton to uh, do handwriting with Terry Harris, the as she says, the guy who taught me how to teach handwriting. So if you give them that date or send that, I'll send you an email, and you maybe. Can spread the word and let people yeah know. yeah yeah we're uh, uh yeah happy to happy to help promote that uh, so yeah and the the, the folks at B, uh, bds are certainly uh, friends of the of the of the precision teaching community for sure so um yeah, yeah that uh, seems like a natural tie-in so great right, i'll make sure all that gets in the show notes and uh, <laughs> again appreciate you spending part of your morning with me well thank you matt i really appreciate you uh, you being available Take care. Stay healthy. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. 
We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.